portraits, you become the interlocutor. It's another fancy way of saying you are telling for somebody else. You're ventriloquating. <laughs> so you become the interlocutor. You have taken away the voice, though, of that person. Right? Hence, reflexivity is a big part of this. Testimonial, then, bears a reality from the margins. It tells the story of the subaltern. It is political. <clears throat> it is urgent. It has an urgent message. And it should provoke action. It should move you to do something about it once you've heard it. Okay? Testimonial. <clears throat> necessitates that you listen very carefully to what is being said and how it is being told. It must point out to an inequity, to an injustice. So what role does privilege play in this? A huge, a huge role, right? So if I'm going into the community to collect testimonials, I am already kind of replicating oppression in a way, unless you're giving, you give the tools to the testimonialistas to tell their own story, which is what I try to do. So testimonial is both the product and the process. Testimonial is your theoretical framework, your analytical tool, and your methodology. It's all of those things. And I know it gets confusing, um, but if, um, so testimonial as, as a theoretical framework. Chicana Latina Feminist Theory brought about this notion of education, of storytelling, of corridos, of um, learning from our elders, Right? of learning from lived experience, that's already given to us by, by Chicana feminist thought, by feminist thought. So testimonial then is your, your, your tool of analysis. You, will, you can use them to be analyzed. You can have testimonials and analyze them to see a larger phenomenon, for example, right? So it is not limited to be used by Chicanas, by Latinas, right? Other folks can use it. Um, it is important, however, that you, that you do approach this then as an interlocutor, as an outside <coughs> activist who transcribes <coughs> and, is, and prepares a manuscript for publication that is clean, neat, not messy, right? <coughs> you do <coughs> translate, as I said earlier, right, when you're, when you're collecting somebody else's testimony. When I collected the ones from the mothers, I offered them the controversial testimonial of Rigoberta Menchu, 1983, who was told, who was very, it was disputed for decades by David Stahl, this big time anthropologist, who said she was a liar. And basically, how can you call somebody a liar when they're telling you her story, right? When they're telling you their own lived experiences, their own reality. So, testimonial then shifts the power dynamics of who is the knower and who is the known, right? If you're going to engage in this collecting testimonials, then who is the knower? You need the knower in this case. Because only she can tell you that, right? So, testimonial telling allows us to name oppression because they are in nature stories of oppression. Okay? And I don't know if your computer is turned on. If I can show a couple from what my students have done. Do you need assistance? I got it. Okay. We smart 
rational subjects. Um, what did you gather from the thesis that you read? What do you, how, do, how did you understand this demonio as a methodological tool? Anybody? Yes. Well, <clears throat> from what I from what I read, there's does is insider and outsider status relevant? It is very much relevant. Like. Like having insider insider status, as I understand it, can 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 help as far as as far as far as as far as gaining information and as far as making the as far as the relationship as far as making the relationship more um, more. Uh, <coughs> More serving to both you and the you and the participants, right? For testimonial, the insider is the person who holds the story, right? Then I'm, I'm the outsider. I'm the one who's trying to get her to tell me mm. it. You cannot force people to tell you testimonials if there isn't confianza or trust, right? So... Why would anybody take the time to give you a testimonial in the first place? What's in it for them? Good question. In my case, I was in the position of power, so I was the one who was the teacher of their children, right? Um, and besides offering them gift cards to grocery stores, Okay. I also did help to do various things that I wasn't supposed to do, right, according to, to academia, to distance myself from the, the subjects or the participants. But I would help them from anything, for, from filling out applications for, for the doctor, mm -hmm. to translating documents, to giving them rights to places. I lived with them. I lived like five blocks away from them. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of codependency. So if there was a give and take there, right? But I still held, held the power. <laughs> and sometimes it was during those 20-minute those rides, right, between the, the Department of Motor Vehicles and, and their home, where they would like just divulge. They would pour themselves out. It was confessional at times. And sometimes they would tell me more than I, than I wanted to know because it wasn't relevant to to my study, right? Yeah. But it definitely uh, strengthened the relationship that we had with each other. So from them telling me about the daughter who ran away and then came back two months later pregnant, and there I was making all these phone calls, right? Like, trying to find out where she was. To other things that, I mean, int intimacy is that you only test, share sometimes woman to woman, right? they will never make it into <laughs> a dissertation, right? For Because of respeto, respect. So when I teach testimonio and when I, when I want students to be moved to tell their own testimonials, it takes a long time. As I, as I told you earlier, I'm teaching it right now. And we've started reading already and it's been very painful, right? I mean, we're talking about rape, we're talking about violence, we're talking about body image, we're talking about identity <coughs> politics, we're talking about traumatic things. So testimonial will also bring out trauma and pain and you will relive it with the participants, right? So you gotta be ready for that. <laughs> Are people anxious to tell you their story once they get going? Yes. So who's, who's, who's writing? Who, who writes the story? In this case? Like it, your dissertation. Oh, in so my dissertation, <laughs> or the, 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 mothers were, the mothers were given a prompt. Mm -hmm. They read the prompt. I gave them each a notebook. 
and it, when they felt moved by the prompt, they okay. they wrote their own stories. Okay. So I don't know that you want to read the whole 250 pages of the dissertation, but but there's samples in there of what we did, and we did a lot of things. We did I I did interviews, I did a focus group, um, I did um, informal participant. I was a per participant observant. I did informal observations. I did a lot of um, informal platicas with them. Like all my interactions, I would go home and memo right away. And then they wrote their own. That was the last thing they did. We did a group activity, and then they wrote their own when they had time. Um, it was two interviews. For the class, in my, this, so what I'm going to show you right now is a couple of things that the students in my classes get moved to tell about. They get moved to share. So testimonial teaching and testimonial as methodology are very much interconnected because you want the participant or the student to be moved by a piece of text or by something they saw or by a prompt or by you sharing your story and then they feel connected and then they interrupt you and they, they start telling their own and then you can't stop them. So for this class, we read five to seven books and it's an underground class. And each time they read something that moves <coughs> them to tell their own papelitos guardados, their own secrets, then they draft it, only I read them, and then at the end of the semester, they produce a small, a, a short film it's all written by them. It's all the th what they want to tell you. It's, it's scripted by them. I didn't get to script it. Of course, I review it for length and all those things. But they have to write 300 or 400 words, and they have to produce it. And so when you watch this, I want you to think about who is the audience here. Right? What are they trying to tell you? And what do they want you to do against whatever injustice they faced, okay? So keep those things in mind. And I know that this is getting recorded, but there's a couple that are um, only for my viewing or for my, you know, for teaching purposes. So only your students will see this, right? Yes. Actually, no. It's on YouTube. Um, I can log it. it we can log it? Okay. Mi papá nació en Ciudad de Jalisco, México. Nació en 
because we were guanacos or vichos and how we couldn't represent the Mexican colors. Culturally lost, perdido. Where was my nationality really from? It wasn't until I came to a college overnight. We spoke about being a minority in a college and how being a different nationality can be a good thing. I realized my fear of being different was a positive step to accepting my culture. Being a minority in a low-income city motivated me to base my research on my nationality so I can proudly wear my colors and step over la frontera que me separa de mi cultura y que nunca miré que tenía. Many of whom are curious and ask what El Salvador has to offer. I happily respond, pupusas y mucho más. She feels the in-between. She bridges cultures, yet destroys. Being Salvadorian in a city where Lama. Sorry, it's another one that I want to show you. Where are you from? I'm from New York. 